Hello and welcome once again to Edgy Catholic Storytime from edgycatholic.com. My name is Joseph Soto Jr. I'm the writer of Edgy Catholic Fiction. I've written my thriller, When the Wind is Dry, an Edgy Catholic Thriller, my graphic novel and comic book series, Blind Prophet, and the book we're going to be reading from today, Merry Friggin' Christmas, an edgy Christmas comedy. This is a Christmas gift for atheists. It comes in a naughty edition and a standard edition. And the naughty edition has worse language in it that I don't try to obscure. So the standard edition, I kind of made up a clever way to kind of censor it, but it's a sight gag, so it doesn't really work with reading it. So we're going to be reading today from the naughty edition, and I am going to just bleep out any kind of bad words that might be in it. I don't think there's that many in this chapter, though. We are on chapter 11, which is back to the psychiatrist. Okay, to set the scene for you a little bit, Carlson St. Michael had a near-death experience, so he's trying to figure out what happened in this vision that he had of the afterlife. And in this vision, G.K. Chesterton made a joke. He said that... uh, The Bible says we should love our neighbors and our enemies because generally they're the same people. Okay, so Carlton thinks this isn't such a funny joke. He wouldn't have made this joke. But the psychiatrist has told him that, you know, it's all from in his imagination. He probably made up the joke himself. He's like, I don't know about that. So he went to look it up at the New York Public Library in our last chapter, and he found out that Chesterton did say that. So now he's feeling like this dream might be real. And if it's real, there's implications for how he needs to live his life. And uh, he doesn't want to face those implications. So, he's going back to the psychiatrist. He's going to have it out with the psychiatrist over this. And uh, just to give you a little extra background, uh, when I converted this scene into the book from the screenplay, I added some of the characters in the waiting room. So, (laughs) you can check out I just thought a psychiatrist's waiting room was going to have some interesting characters in it, so I had a little fun with it, okay? So I added them in when I made it into a novel. Okay, all right. So let's get back to Chapter 11 of Merry Friggin' Christmas, an edgy Christmas comedy, the naughty edition, which is called Back to the Psychiatrist. Well, I stormed, if limping on a cane can ever be considered storming, on back to that quack psychiatrist's office. Oh, Carlton, I'm sure it's your joke. I told that idiot I wouldn't make a stupid joke like that. That's not an atheist joke. That's a Catholic joke, if there ever was one, or at minimum Christian. I barged into the waiting room in time to catch him escorting the woman in search of mice for her cat out of the examining room. At least it wasn't the idiot with his finger in his ear. Some new psycho was in the waiting room, mumbling something unintelligible. He wore a navy blazer, dress shirt, and gray slacks, and would have looked rather normal if his eyes hadn't appeared to roll around like dice on a craps table, never quite settling down to snake eyes. The man with his finger in his ear appeared to watch him intently as if he had his last dollar on the pass line and a craps roll would send him to the poorhouse. I threw a printout of the web article with Chesterton's face on it at Dr. Freundheim. The patients in the waiting room looked on, agitated. The mumbling man looked up at me, blinking and fell silent, his mouth falling slackly open, his eyes settling into the feared two craps. The man fingering his ear stuck out his tongue. A nervous, quiet focus became palpable as the mental patient seemed intent on hearing what I had to say. He said it, doctor. Disdain and disgust colored my voice in the blood red and bilious green of an atheist's Christmas. It wasn't my joke. Easy, easy, Mr. St. Michael. You're upsetting the other psychotics. I'm not a psychotic, doctor. He said it. Who said what? Chesterton. He made that stupid joke about enemies and neighbors. 
The mumbling man got all excited by this talk and seemed to piece together a special message delivered by God, or maybe that other fellow, or one of his minions. Yes, yes, my neighbor is my enemy. I must kill my neighbor. The mumbler scrambled up and hurried out the door. Dr. Freundheim shook his head. Now look what you've done. He took out his cell phone and speed dialed the police. Harvey, Dr. Freundheim here. It's Mr. Howard. You better pick him up before he tries to kill Mrs. Hollander again. Yeah, that's right. One of my other patients set him off. He'll likely use the squirt gun, but you'd best be careful. It's very real to him. Dr. Freundheim hung up his cell phone and glared at me. Now, Mr. St. Michael, what's all this about? Dr. Freundheim, the fat bastard said it, word for word, just like in my dream. Dr. Freundheim glanced at the piece of paper. Now, Mr. St. Michael, please step into my office and let's discuss this. I went with Dr. Freundheim back into the examining room. Please have a seat, Mr. St. Michael, Dr. Freundheim said, looking at the printout of the article I had thrown at him. Okay, so he said it. So what? You probably heard it on that show while you were half awake. You probably just forgot you overheard it. Maybe you picked it up from the TV while you were semi-conscious. There's always a rational explanation. Yes, yes, that must be it. Of course, there's always the possibility that St. Mary and St. Luke intervened to save your life. I mean, there is always an irrational explanation as well. My jaw dropped open in shock. I wondered for a moment if I had stumbled into some alternate reality where everybody was in the business of messing with my mind. It occurred to me that I was in positively the worst place to be having paranoid thoughts. I was certain that Dr. Friend Home had a straitjacket stowed in some closet or compartment that would be readily accessed. The doctor read my panicked appearance and sighed. I saw the report on the news, Mr. St. Michael. The kid stuffed rosary beads in your pocket and prayed for the saint's intervention. Look, Doc, that's not funny. If it's true, I've got to change. Change the way I think about everything, or I'll be in hell with Nietzsche. If you had seen it, you wouldn't joke around. Nietzsche? In hell? That must have been some dream. I realized I had said too much. I thought I saw the doctor glance toward the closet. Well, I often dream of German philosophers in hell. It really wasn't that unusual. I calmed myself and was a picture of nonchalance. Dr. Freundheim shook his head and smiled. Well, you did say you were a comedian. Only a comedian would think it was not unusual to dream of German philosophers in hell. Well, it's not only Germans. I once dreamed I tried to ride a log flume with Kierkegaard at Disney World. I think he was Danish. One of the great Danes. But they said they didn't allow dogs on the rides. I suspected I had not improved my situation. The doctor looked at me like I was nuts. And he was an expert on pecans, almonds, and fruitcakes, for sure. He shook his head and looked down for a moment. I think he glanced under the desk. Mr. St. Michael, millions of people believe in irrational things without having a dream to provoke them into it. When we find rational explanation for events, they make us feel comfortable, like the world is working the way it should. But things happen all the time, where the rational explanation seems a bit of a stretch. People grab onto the rational because it makes them feel safe, like things are happening as expected, by rules we can understand. But that doesn't necessarily disprove the irrational explanation. It just gives us an alternative to believing in something that may be less predictable and more intentional. Things that are out of our control and yet intentional, we find to be threatening, even menacing, if we don't trust the intelligence that is intentionally directing things. 
We may feel safer in a random, chaotic universe than in a more controlled moral universe, especially if we enjoy activities that may be morally questionable. But some people have very strong beliefs in less rational explanations, like God is in control, and that, ironically, makes them feel safe, no matter what happens, as long as they live lives that they feel will be pleasing to God. Or even if they don't, but trust that God is merciful and will forgive them. But which explanation is correct? Well, who can really say? Your experience in your dream is convincing you that there may be a God. And if there is, you expect he will not be pleased with how you have been living. Is that correct? Look, Doc, if there's a God, I mean... I was being pulled apart by demons in that friggin' dream. And Jesus saved me. I can't believe any of that crap. But if it's true, if it's real, I have to change everything. They told me I had 40 days to make a decision. I don't even know what I'm supposed to decide. Okay, so all you told me before was that Chesterton was in your dream and that he was a real person. And then that Nietzsche was in hell. But it sounds like you have actually had a profound near-death experience. Many people who have these kinds of experiences find meaning in them and respond by making major changes in their lives. The phenomenon is more common than you might think. But I don't want to make any changes. I want to be the person I was the atheist, the comedian on the verge of stardom, not some Bible-believing buffoon. I mean, it was just a dream, wasn't it? I shouldn't have to change, should I? You could always just wait 40 days and see what happens. Doctor, you are not helping. I see I'm upsetting you. I did not mean to. The kid who saved you was pretty religious, correct? One of these Bible believers you have such disdain for. Worse, he was a friggin' Catholic. That's right, stuck rosary beads in your pocket. Very Catholic. I mean, who does that, friggin' brat? Well, why don't you look him up? It might do you some good to thank him. Get his perspective. If he sounds like a religious nut to you, the rational explanation will seem more plausible. The more you can do to convince yourself that the dream was not real, that it could not be real, the less you will feel like you need to make changes because of the dream. I reached into my pocket for the rosary beads the kid had given me. Why was I carrying them around with me anyway? My instincts were right. I needed to disprove that crazy dream, find all the inconsistencies. But Chesterton was a real person, who really said those dopey things. Of course, I could have picked it up from that stupid priest watching that television program. The accident, that was real. My friggin' busted up body, that was real. That idiot, Nicholas Pennymore, he was real. And the kid? The kid was real. He had saved my life. I should really thank him. Maybe if I made what was real more real, what was not real would be less real. That dream could not be real. But the rosary beads, they were real. I showed the rosary beads to Dr. Freundheim. You know, I've been carrying these around since the accident. Why would I do that? I'll go see the kid. I gotta give these back. Yes, yes, there's a good idea. You've been through a lot, Mr. St. Michael. These near-death experiences can be very disorienting and even cause life-altering changes in perspective. Your mind will continue to try to piece things together and make things make sense. That's perfectly normal. Thank you, Doctor. I'm sorry if I was disruptive. I just haven't been myself since the accident. Have you thought about getting help with your substance abuse problem? I think we can help you with that as well. One problem at a time, Doctor. If I'm going to hell in a couple of weeks, 
I'm going to need all the painkillers I can get my hands on. Yeah, he looked at me like I was crazy. And he was a guy who knows crazy. So I resolved to be more careful next time. Okay. <laughs> so there you have chapter 11 of Merry Friggin' Christmas, an edgy Christmas comedy, Back to the Psychiatrist. And uh, in our next episode, we will pick it up with chapter 12, Returning the Beads, where he will go and see the young boy who saved his life and return the rosary beads. Okay, so that is it. Merry Friggin' Christmas and Edgy Christmas Comedy. My name is Joseph Silver Jr. I'm a writer of edgy, crisp, edgy Catholic fiction. And uh, my novel, my thriller, is When the Winter's Dry, an edgy Catholic thriller. It's a very different book. It's more, it's even more religious than this one. So, and then A Blind Prophet, which has a boy who's able to see into the spiritual realm and see demons tempting people. So that's kind of an interesting concept. It's a comic book and graphic novel. And my novel, Merry Friggin' Christmas, which we've been reading from, an edgy Christmas comedy, which is meant to be a Christmas gift for atheists. So if you have an atheist on your list, get him a copy. He'll get a good laugh out of the cover anyway. If he starts reading it, he'll like the beginning, and maybe he'll get sucked in. Who knows? You never know. It's a Christmas book for atheists. So, you know, take it easy. we we got to love these people and try to nudge them a little bit toward the faith. That's all we're trying to do here. Okay. Anyway, that's it for story time. Edgy Catholic story time. My name is Joseph Solo Jr. We will see you next time. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.